pase, pierna derecha, directo al arco, golazo, golazo, golazo. The world of football with a soccer perspective. This is Soccer Today with Dwayne Mullins and Kevin Laramie, live on the Sports Podcasting Network. And good day, good night, and welcome to Soccer Today for Friday, March 16, 2018. Yes, uh, the big day is upon us. Montreal Impact's home opener tomorrow versus TFC. We'll talk this in the second segment. But to start the show today, the only Canadian team left in our winter preview rounds is TFC2. They start their season this weekend. And to talk about the Peter Club, the Toronto FC, joining us right now, James Grossi. James, how are you doing this morning? Uh, not too bad. How are you guys doing? Good, good. James is one of the few people that uh, covers uh, TFC2 day in, day out in, in a way that I probably you're the only one who does it as, as intensely as as, as maybe a, a beat writer almost, right? So so there's no better person to ask about this. That said, uh, this is a, a difficult team to get a handle on sometimes because it, it, is it its own club? Is it a separate club? Is it a farm team? Is it a, an academy team? It's hard to get a real handle on it. So I'm going to ask you that. What is TFC2, James? That is a very good question. You know, um, watching the last few seasons, as you said, it's been really hard to tell exactly what what they wanted this team to be, whether they wanted it to be a standalone club, and is that why it was based out up in Bonn, where it was sort of, you know, maybe going to be the big team in that market, or or do they want it to be somewhere where guys who are with the first team aren't getting minutes or sort of keeping themselves sharp and fit, or, or do they just want it to be a development team where, the guys that they want to see in that first team in the next two, three, four years are sort of cutting their teeth at the professional level. Um, the season is just about to get underway, and I think, I think having spoken with uh, Laurent Gaillot, the new coach, I think we're going to see a little bit more of a of a defined role for this team this year. Um, back before, you know, if you if you spoke to to Jason Bent or if you spoke to to Greg Vanny or you spoke to Tim Bezpachenko about the side, they would be adamant that that the team had two goals. You know, the goal was to compete and to win, and the goal was also to develop players for the first team. And speaking with Laurent, he broke it down that it was sixty percent about winning and it was forty percent about development. And so they still sort of have that dual purpose role. But I think with Laurent there, who was who was who was and will still be the head of the academy director for Toronto FC, we're going to see that that development in that second team and, and that reserve team sort of function be a little more clear than it may have been in the past. If you look at MLSC as a whole, and obviously there's not an exact comparison between the Raptors and the Leafs and TFC. But when you look at MLSC as a whole, they have two other farm teams that, that they own. They own the Raptors 905. They won a championship last year. They own the Toronto Marlies. They're in first place right now. There's a lot of success for those farm teams. Obviously a bit of a different system there, but do you think maybe there's some best practices kind of going forth in, in, the, uh, in the company as a whole that's sort of suggesting that maybe a bigger focus on winning is good for the overall development? I think... I think winning is something that, that you learn as well as something that you accomplish. And that's something that, that everyone's spoken about. It doesn't do, it doesn't do these young players any good to be going out every week and, and getting shellacked as, as they had in the past. And so that is, that is definitely something they're trying to instill. And, and, you know, I was up there speaking with the guys this week, just a little bit after, uh, after Toronto sees CONCACAF champions league win on Tuesday. And, you know, the fact that, that the first team, these guys that they sort of train with off and on, these guys that they see around, these guys that they have lunch with are, are achieving what they are achieving is, is really good for the ambition that it instills in these young players. You know, when you look at when you look at the AHL team or the, the Raptors 905, you know, I don't know if you can make that direct comparison. Just in my understanding is those are both sort of development leagues in in a sense, like they're, they're farm affiliate sort of setups whereas you know the usl is a standalone league and they're competing with with professionals you know who are 35 year old veterans of the game who have cut their teeth in some of the some of the best leagues around the planet and so it's not exactly a straight comparison but i think when it comes to to having success you know I would say that TFC2, if you compare it to the Marlies and you compare it to the Rockers 905, they're still very, very young. And 
it's a very different system from either of those. But I'm sure that, you know, with Bill Manning, with Tim Bezvachenko, and with Laurent sort of at the helm, they'll be doing everything they can to make sure this club's a winner. Now, when we're looking at the USL and Canadian teams, there's been uh, uh, two sad stories over the last few years. The disappearance of the Whitecaps FC2 this season and FC Montreal two seasons ago. TFC2 is the lone remaining USL affiliate, literally MLS two sides from MLS Canadian teams. Is this project for the long term? And we're seeing this this time around, this offseason, a lot of changes with TFC2. James, they're they're going to Lamport and moving around a bit. They're even going to play some games in Rochester. But is this project in, in this new iteration almost, is it here for the long run? Are the funds... Because it's, it's not a cost-effective venture. It has been costly in the millions of dollars. Is this for the long run? Yeah, you know, you never want to project too far out in the future, just in, you know, what, what tomorrow brings five years down the road, ten years down the road, you never really know. And so what I would say about TFC2 and how it sort of fits into the club structure is is they've been developing, you know, the TFC Academy started back in 2008, and it's gone through through various sort of iterations as, as the different regimes have come through in the front office and, and in the coaching staff. And the last couple of years, they've been really honing in on, on what they call the player development pathway. And the, the role of the USL franchise is very much, you know, it's filling a need that Canadian soccer sort of didn't have. We, we've seen Canadian players at the under 14, under 15, under 17 level go around the world and, and compete with players from, from countries that have much better histories on the world stage. And the problem, or at least my understanding of the problem for, for a certain amount of that development was that once you turn 16, once you turn 17, there wasn't really anywhere for you to go to continue developing your skills. You know, one in a hundred kids would have a chance to go over to Europe because of some, you know, grandfather or grandparent that was born in some country or another. And so there was this sort of, there was a bottleneck in the Canadian development system. And so TFC two is sort of meant to alleviate that in the sense that they have, they have players as young as 12 that are sort of under their umbrella and TFC2 is where they get their first sort of taste of that professional day in, day out, year round training atmosphere. And so, you know, will things change in the future? It, it, it's hard to say if, if it, it would be hard to say that things will never change and this team will be around forever. But I think as they, as they have developed this player pathway structure, it, it's a very important aspect of it. We're looking at the the crowd aspect of TFC too. The last few years, it has been difficult in Vaughan. Now, with the move to Lamport Stadium for a few matches, BMO Field for others, are you expecting a bitter, a bigger following for this club? I don't want to say just the word crowd, but being a quote unquote two side, it's hardcores and dedicated fans will follow it, but the mainstream still shies away from it. Are you seeing this change maybe with the relocation of this team to Toronto proper? I'll have a better idea in a couple of weeks. You know, they start their home campaign this year with a, a battle of Ontario against Ottawa Fury at the end of the month. And I think we'll get a, a better sense of sort of how much this move downtown has brought them into, into people's, into people's awareness, you know, being up in Vaughan, People knew it was happening, but Vaughn was sort of, um, it was out of the way, you know, and there was an element of out of sight, out of mind. And, you know, the matches were available and they're all on YouTube, which is amazing. But if you aren't really particularly aware of what's happening or who's up there or anything like that, or are you really going to go out of your way to sort of track it? You know, one of the things that, that the first team did, that Toronto FC did, was that with every season ticket that's purchased, you get a season pass effectively to the TFC2 games. And so just by integrating that, that sort of, there's a free aspect to this that will, will make everybody who comes to those Toronto FC games aware that if they want a little bit more soccer, there will be some convenient soccer either at BMO Field or at Lamport. Rochester is not exactly convenient, but I mean, it, it you know. You can't win all the little battles. And so, you know, I'll have a better answer in, in a couple of weeks in terms of how, how aware people are, how interested they are. The whole, the whole secondary team sort of makes it a little bit 
a little bit difficult to gauge because, you know, North America is very much about uh, if it's not the top tier, it's not really necessarily worth worth going out and supporting, which, you know, I very much disagree with because for all the fun that it has been to sort of be, be watching TFC and watching their ascent over the last couple of years, there was something... Uh, there were, it was a frustrating season for TFC too, but there were a lot of little triumphs contained within that. That you know, if you're sort of a fan of of sport and all of the all of the successes and failures that sort of make sport up, it it was uh, it was a pretty good year. Yeah, no, and I enjoy it a great deal. I'm looking forward to watching the games this year. I suspect I'll get to to most of them, uh, barring sort of uh, you know, it's uh, uh, I mean something else going on with TFC proper probably, but. Uh, that that's sort of what I just said. PSC TSC proper sort of suggested maybe some rebranding would would be useful for this team down the line at some point. But that's an aside completely. Um, James, I do have a question in terms of how they will use uh, the, the how the main team, how the first team will use TFC two this year. In the past, we have not seen very much loaning down other than the kids. I mean, Jordan Hamilton, uh, Jay Chapman, those guys. They're almost two players in in many ways that happen to play with the first team occasionally. Do you think we'll see more? You know, Nick Hagelin needs a run out. He'll go up. Uh, and guys injured coming back will go up. Do you think they'll still use the team more in that sort of traditional reserve team way this year now that it's a little closer, now that it's on grass? I think I think the key the key word there is grass. You know, I, I don't think I don't think Greg Vanny and the coaching staff were really enamored with the surface up at the Ontario Soccer Center, which is, is understandable. I, I've, I've never played on it myself, and I, I'm not much of a soccer player, if I'm being honest, but you know, the word was that it was slow and it was sticky and every time a visiting team would come in, somebody would go down with a muscle injury just because their cleats didn't quite work right in it. And so, you know, if you have Nick Hagelin who's coming back from two knee injuries last year, are you really going to trot him out on a pitch that you're you're uncertain of? You know, the, the double-edged sword with this question is sort of, if this is a development team, and you have these, these 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds that you really want to get the minutes at this level and see, see what they can become. Do you want to sacrifice those minutes for a guy like Nick Hagelin in, in order to improve the first team, or would you rather TFC two use as many minutes as they can for that development aspect? You know, when you look at the first team roster, there are, there are a good number of guys on that team that are going to find it really hard to get minutes. You mentioned Jay Chapman, you mentioned, you know, Jordan Hamilton, Ben Spencer, the two new signings, Liam Frazier and Io Akinola, I, I don't necessarily see where they're going to be getting a lot of minutes. And so it does become very tempting to to get them the games that they need to continue to develop and to have them fresh for when emergencies pop up that they are getting the minutes at two. But then again, you are taking minutes away from, from the players that ostensibly you want to see ready to join the MLS side in the next couple of years. My personal hunch is that that's part of that's part of what Laurent was sort of getting at when it came to this club being more more solidified in its identity as a two team in that the first team may take priority sometimes the first team may you know we may see a, a weekend where where Clint Irwin really needs a game because he hasn't played in a while we may see a weekend where you know Caleb Sewell Patterson really needs to get some some time, and we'll see that. And so, I very much expect that the TFC two roster is not exactly filled out right now. I think they have 16 players currently on the on the books, and they're a little bit short in a couple of positions. So, I I very much would imagine that we'd be seeing a fair number of first teamers down there over the course of the year. Of course, uh, the TFC two is part of an integrated system that goes uh, all the way down to U twelves and includes TFC three. Uh, the League One Ontario team, which which I followed a little bit closer than TFC2 the past couple of years because of my affiliation with League One Ontario. So let me ask you directly about that three to two sort of um, pyramid. Uh, and many players, any players that you can see making that jump this year, uh, anyone we want to look out that's going to continue their move up and move into the first, the fully pro rank for the first time from three. Um, well, I think you'd be more familiar with TFC three players than I necessarily would be. But one of the interesting things that TFC has done as part of that, that player pathway thing is that players can move up and down. So if you see a younger player that, that hasn't seen minutes for two, he'll often show up down at three. And so there were a, a large number of guys who, who would have basically split the season between the two clubs last year. And they've, they've instituted a, it's a kind of a unique contract. It's it's a, 
I think the professional deal, I'm, I'm not entirely certain on the details, but they call it, they call it a TFC two, a TFC three contract game. Sort of you've signed a deal to play with TFC two, but you're not exactly at that. They're, they're trying to make gradations in terms of, of where you fit on that pyramid. And so like, if you look at guys like last year, we saw Dante Campbell and Julian Dunn and Rocco Romeo and Novo Akello and, and uh, Matt Serbley, I think, is, is another one of the guys that falls under that umbrella of guys who, who were sort of, you know, 17-year-olds, 16-year-olds that are, are ready to make that jump to USL, but they're not necessarily of the same, of the core group that makes up the USL team. So, I mean, those are, those are a number of players who I think we're going to see big contributions from this year. You know, Julian Dunn, was a, he was a 16-year-old when he joined the team last year, and he was just... Uh, you know, sometimes you watch a defender and they just have this knack for sort of being in the right place and making the right play and, and reading the intentions of the attacker. And as a 16-year-old playing against, uh, you know, some of the grizzled veterans you come across in USL, it was just incredibly impressive to watch. And Rocco Romeo is another another big boy who's, who's got a good head on his shoulders and he'll be one to sort of keep an eye on. And Noble Akello is another massively tall young man and I, I interviewed all three of them at the same time and I felt insanely short at the time. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I mean like you know those guys you know Dante Dante Campbell is a right back and and he's uh he's a real feisty sort of scrapper and I don't know if I've ever seen somebody who, who relishes competing as much as he does and you know Matt's Matt Serbley is a really sort of technical silky sort of ball mover through the middle and so there's a lot of, of really, really interesting talent that's sort of at that 16, 17, 18-year-old age that they're going to need a couple of years before we're talking about them being ready for the first team, but I know a lot of people have had eyes on them. Uh, Rocco Romeo is a guy that I've been talking about for a couple of years now. He's real nice on the ball, and, and as you said, he's a tree out there. He's a, a, a stupid tall at any rate. Uh, exactly. oh, and they're just, they just keep growing, man. Like I, I saw Rocco... <laughs> Uh, when TFC had their MLS Cup parade, I was walking down the street and I, I looked over and there's this guy taking pictures and it was Rocco and I was just like, "What are you doing here?" And so, <laughs> you know, these are guys that are they're gonna have been at TFC for years by the time they make it to the first team. And you know, as a as a local fan, as a as a Canadian guy, you know, these are the sort of things that that you sort of want to see a, a club do. All right, uh, before we we move, we take a quick break and talk a little bit about. Uh, about the Derby this weekend, uh, the 401 Derby first installment of the year with, with James. Uh, real quickly, just sort of run down the roster of players that we might want to look at and, and sort of what the expectations for TFC2 are on the field from your perspective this year. Yeah, so I sort of break the roster in, into three main parts, and then there's a fourth part that sort of uh, will become self-evident when I, when I get there. So the core group is sort of those guys that are, are entering their third or fourth year. This you know, We're talking about guys like Luca Cello, Angel Cavaluso, you know, Aiden Daniels, Sean Hundle, Malik Johnson. And they are going to be, they're going to be the core in terms of, you know, week in, week out, the guys that are going to be on the team sheet or thereabouts. And they're going to be relied upon to really, to really sort of be the engine of the team. You know, these, these are guys that have, They've played together for several years. They've, they've been at this club and, and they've been at this level and they're going to be relied upon to sort of be the engine that powers the side. You know, second to that is is in the last few years and, and pretty much since, since the club has been around, there's always been an element of international players that sort of come in to supplement, whether they're, they're true international finds, like look at guys like Jelani Peters or, or Ike Commanders that came through some connections the club has down in, uh, in the Caribbean. Or if there are draft picks, guys who, who the first team has picked up through the super draft and they didn't quite find a spot on the first team roster, but they stick around with uh, TFC2 for a couple of years just to see how they progress. And so, you know, this year so far, Tim Kubel is uh, is a guy who's who's inked to deal with TFC2. So, you know, he's a 25-year-old guy. We, we spoke about him a lot when TFC drafted him. He's got some, some Bundesliga Academy experience. He spent four years at Louisville, I believe. So he'll be a guy that's expected to sort of bring a little bit of that, not necessarily, it's always hard to say veteran now, so you're talking about a 25-year-old, but I mean, he'll be a guy who'll, who'll be expected to be solid and who'll be up for it, and he'll be he'll provide, as much as he's new to the side, he'll provide a little bit of leadership and a bit of a steady hand. 
And then, you know, alongside that, they've added a, a young African kid that, that we haven't really seen anything of yet. His name is Gideon Weah. He's from uh, a Ghanaian academy. And so that's just a – it's a way that they sort of take the, the local talent that they have and they supplement it with uh, some interesting skills from, from around the world that they want to keep a closer eye on. And then the third group I would add are, are all those young players we were talking about earlier where they're the guys that have come up through the system and they're the guys that they're sort of – you know, they anticipate in the next couple of years they're going to be part of that core group. And, you know, they're, they're, there's a fair bit of flexibility. Sometimes there are guys who who don't quite come up through, especially now that the TFC system is still relatively new. You know, we saw Ryan Telfer sort of come into the side after a good collegiate career here and, and sort of made a name for himself. But so those are the three main categories that I would put in. And then the fourth one is sort of the first teamers that are coming down for minutes and the academy guys that are, are coming up for minutes from the academy, you know, I don't get to see a lot of TFC three or, or the younger levels, but I know that they have a number of players down there that, that will have a tendency to come up when, when the time is there. You know, we saw, we saw a couple of minutes for Daniel De Silva last year. We saw John Luke, John Luca Catalano on the bench for a couple of matches last year. He's a goalkeeper that, that I think they're very fond of. And so, that's sort of how I would break down the roster in terms of, of how it's composed. In terms of what to expect from the team this year, you know, we haven't seen a lot of them in preseason. They didn't really, well, we didn't really see any of them in preseason, if I'm being honest. And uh, until we, we get to see the matches and we get to see sort of how the team has come together, it's really, really hard to forecast just how they're going to do in a competition where, where the teams they are playing are, are you know, vastly different. Um, you have the fellow MLS two sides, you have, you know, teams that are really trying to make a push for MLS. You have, you know, teams that are just sort of, you know, storied and respected clubs in their own right, but they're happy to be at, at the USL level and, and their salary budgets are sort of reflective of that. And so there's a wide range of competition. You know, they, they will, speaking with them this week, their goal is to win games and their goal is to make the playoffs as it is every year. Um, in terms of whether they'll be able to do that, you know, uh, only time will tell. All right, James, uh, we'll take a quick break. Uh, you hold the line. We're going to talk about the 401 Derby after this. You are listening to Soccer Today. Follow us on Twitter at Soccer Today SPN and like our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash sports podcasting network. Dwayne Rollins with myself, Kevin Laramie, and James Grossi on the line. The Two Solitudes Derby, the first one of the year. <laughs> Tomorrow, 3 p.m. at the Stade Olympic, the Big O. And James, are you excited for this uh, this uh, 401 slash Two Solitudes Derby for the first one of the season? For starters, I'm excited that you're calling it the Two Solitudes Derby, man. That's way better. Ha! <laughs> two Solitudes uh, wins! Woohoo! <laughs> uh yeah you know these these games are always really special i'll be i'll be heading into town um there's nothing quite like a, a toronto montreal game it doesn't matter what competition it is it doesn't matter where both teams are in the standing it doesn't matter what time of year it is they're always they're always pretty special and so you know this one will have a little bit extra as there'll be a, a young man who was a who was a a big uh <laughs> Who was a favorite of the of the Toronto fans here, suiting up in the Montreal colors? So uh, I think I think we'll see some good numbers making the trip, and I'm I'm sure it'll be a fun afternoon. We're gonna have a couple. Uh, Montreal's offense is being completely driven by Toronto players so far this year. Uh, Lovitz and uh, Edwards. Is that not true, Kevin? <laughs> yeah, that's two. Yeah, Piatti, Piatti may be a bad, but yeah. ah, just a bad. But the dream, <laughs> Raheem, the dream. Edwards, yeah, that, that that was a nice goal last weekend. A goal of the week, by the way, it has to be. I hope it won because it has to. <laughs> but when we're looking on the pitch, or on this case, on the terrible turf pitch of the Stade Olympic uh, tomorrow at 3 p.m., it, it's a tough week for TFC. Travel, altitude, Monterey, high of emotions, and 20 minutes of panic and more uh, other emotions. Will we see those emotions carry through? To the pitch on Saturday, or will we see those emotions and all the excitement the last few days impede the starting eleven, maybe, of the Toronto team on Saturday? 
Yeah, you know, that's another one of those things that, like, we, I will give you my best guess, and this will come in two forms. You know, if you listen to anything that TSC has said this this year, I sort of have an unofficial count going with some of the other media members, and uh, the number of times we've heard one game at a time, one play at a time, some variation of that as the approach that this club wants to take this year. If you were to believe that and take that at face value, that would mean that, you know, Tuesday night's game is done. They're on to the next one. The next one is three points in Montreal. They're a valuable three points. Being a little bit more realistic about it, you know, given it's the turf in Montreal and we saw a couple of Toronto players struggling with injury, you know, two were forced off down in uh, Monterey. And another, Victor Vasquez, is, is still not 100%, or, or we can presume that. Uh, you know, do you want to risk? Do you want to risk further extending those? You know, both both Justin Morrow and, and Chris Mavinga seem to come off with what were muscle related injuries. We haven't gotten an update yet, but you know, if if they're if they're at all in risk, do they want to take that risk given the the magnitude of some of the matches they have coming up? And then, you know, add to that 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 this is a, a team that. You know, maybe has maybe has twenty, twenty three, twenty four guys who are sort of expecting to play minutes this year. And when when you have those kind of players, you need to find chances for them to play. And so, is this a chance for you know maybe Jordan Hamilton to get a start? Is this a chance for you know maybe Jay Chapman to get some minutes? You know, those are the sort of questions that I'm sure Greg Vanny will be will be asking himself and uh, having to come up with an answer for uh, before kickoff on Saturday and. You know, if I, if, oh. Go ahead. Uh, if if I was going to uh, forecast, I would expect I would expect there to be some changes. You know, I'd expect a, a Gary Ketche to see some minutes. I'd expect, you know, maybe maybe Ashton Morgan to see some minutes. But but you know, PFC also has a pretty long break after this game on Saturday, and so being preseason, Vanny might see this as a chance to sort of push the fitness of, of those guys that he wants to be his core group and and get them ready to really take to the semifinals with uh, with the best they can. Of course, the international break coming up quick, right? Um, I, other than chaining him to the CN Tower, I suspect we'll see Michael Bradley out there. But uh, do you think that, um, that because they lost that game against Columbus, that that might impact how Greg Vanny approaches this lineup, that he might have went with a greater rotation had they had three points in the bank? don't want to fall six points down already, even even if it is only two weeks, three weeks into the season, two weeks into TFC's home or uh, MLS season. Do you think that might have impacted his decision-making? Definitely. I think it's something that will be in his mind. You know, technically they're only one point off the pace that they set last year, so I, I don't think it's anything to worry about overly at this point. But, you know, there's sort of been that general expected rule that, you know, the midweek – cross conference away matches are the ones that you can sort of you can play around with a little bit. If you give up three points to San Jose because you didn't travel your guys for a Wednesday game, nobody's gonna fault you that much. But if you give up three points to Columbus, that that could come back to bite you. If you give up three points to Montreal, especially Montreal, that could definitely come back to bite you. So I don't know if necessarily the loss to Columbus will will be a factor, but you know, I think this is a game that they will definitely go in wanting to win. Right, Kevin, I, let me ask you from a Montreal perspective, uh, what kind of attention do you think this game will, will have on them? Do you think that they're looking at this just as another opportunity to build or is the Derby aspect uh, going to motivate these players uh, players more to sort of step up and, and prove a point against against the champions coming in? First game at home for Rémi Gap as well. And you're measuring yourself to the champion, the team that's going to the semifinal of the CONCACAF Champions League. You're at home and you're playing on turf too. Just want to remind our listeners, uh, four out of the first five games for the Montreal Impact are played on an artificial surface, so I think it does have a say in how Montreal approaches games tactically. That being said, Montreal's fitness levels have been extremely high this season so far, taking control of games late uh, in the last two games, and were able to dictate the tempo on the road, so I can only imagine what they were trying to do at home on a fast surface versus what could be either an unexperienced Toronto side or a tired experience, uh, tired Toronto side, depending of which starting 11 and which change Greg Vanny does do. So I do feel for Montreal, 
when you know the first game at home and the famous oh they have the onus of play on them i think we're going to see a bit of the lessons that Rémi Gann has uh, learned over the last two games and we've seen in-game adjustment by him uh, dictate results for Montreal not necessarily on the score sheet with points but on the play and the way they were organized and the way they're going forward and generating a lot more chances than their amount of goals would dictate so I do feel Montreal will have a bit of an advantage on the fitness side because of their freshness they're a bit more fresh this beginning of the season than Toronto and this might play a role on a hard surface where after running for 75 80 minutes you might feel it in the back of your legs a quick quick straw pull to all of us uh, does Raheem Edwards start does he score if he scores does he celebrate Kevin he starts uh, at this point I would say he starts because he scored, but Vargas did hit the bar, so it's, it's a toss-up. If he starts, I don't know if he scores. No, you know what? I don't know if he starts, but he scores. That's for sure. Okay. He scores, and he kind of celebrates. Kind of, because his celebration was cut short. He could not enjoy it. He, two days after, yeah, bye, man. You're done. So he could only celebrate for 48 hours, and he will make sure that he celebrates a bit, I think. All right, James, same question to you. Uh, I'm going to say he starts just because he seems to have had a really lively sort of beginning to his season, and uh, he seems to really fit well what Remy Guard is going for. I think he scores because, as you and I both know, Dwayne, the history of former Toronto <laughs> FC players coming back to score goals against the club is is yeah. uh, long and storied. <laughs> and whether he celebrates, you know, I, I couldn't tell you whether he's going to celebrate or not, but judging from the pictures that the Montreal uh, press, uh, the Montreal media has been putting out, it, uh, it seems like he will definitely not be smiling while he's doing it. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> well, he doesn't seem to be smiling a lot, but I think that's uh, it was the same in Toronto. I can say uh, one of my uh, he's a pretty smiley guy here. Huh? Yeah, but pretty intense too i remember a few times you were next to me last year uh when we were doing scrums and one of those times were uh in the canadian championship and a little later during the season talking to uh, raheem when it's the time to talk and when the light is on raheem is pretty intense and that's a quality i love that about him but yeah it's intense all right yeah, I, that's I, fair, that's fair. all right I, I say he does score and he rips off his shirt to reveal Boom. an entire class an entire Ooh. clown outfit. It's going to be so oh. trolly. It's going to be amazing. All right, there you go. <laughs> I thought you were saying he's going to rip his shirt and there's a TFC shirt on. I'm going to be like, no. Oh, no. He's gonna, the be... guy's going to get traded if he does that. He's going to pull going to pull some juggling balls out and go. Dit, 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 dit. It's going to become a UMO2 legend instantaneously. Um, yeah. There you go. Just just another layer to the Derby boy. All right, that's fun. All right, I guess uh, we, we've held, held you for quite a bit, James. So before we say goodbye and let the uh, listeners know how to uh, read your work, uh, we'll get a prediction on, on the Derby this weekend. How do you think it ends? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm going to go with a, a nice, entertaining 2-2 draw. You know, Montreal's, Montreal's feeling pretty good based on how their season started. TFC is probably going to have some heavy legs and, and – uh, some full hearts given the way that their their last few weeks have gone so i, I see it being a pretty intense 2 two draw all right kevin and i are going to set the rest of the weekend up after this quick break but uh, before we do that we'll get our prediction in then before we do that james tell the listeners how to follow your work uh will i am um, i cover toronto fc for mlssoccer.com for my tfc2 coverage you're going to want to head over to waking the red over at sb nation and uh, you can follow me on twitter at g-r-a-w-s-e-e thank all you. right thanks james and we'll be all right, right back thanks. after the break with the games of the weekend you are listening to soccer today follow us on twitter at soccer today spn and like our facebook page facebook.com forward slash sports podcasting network You can find the podcast version of all the shows we do on iTunes, Apple Podcast, Google Play Store, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and anywhere you get your podcast. And we're back on Soccer Today. Dwayne Rollins with myself, Kevin Laramie. Dwayne, before we talk about the rest of the games of the weekend, let's start with our prediction of the two Sawtooth's Derby of tomorrow afternoon. Montreal Impact receives Toronto FC for their home opener 
at the Big O in front of what hopefully is a big crowd. What is your prediction for tomorrow's game? It's kind of got draw written all over it in many ways. I, I think, as as James sort of pointed out, the heavy legs, the sort of the emotional letdown, you can't discount that. that as much as you want to talk about one game at a time and all that sort of cliche stuff, you're coming down from a high of, of winning, you know, winning a tie in Mexico and, and doing something that's, you know, pretty significant and historic for the club. And even though the impact are the Derby, it is the rival, they do play each other a lot. So it's impossible for players to get up, 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 up as much as maybe the fans would like them for every time they play each other. So, so I think this has got a draw written on over it. Uh, Montreal has shown a weakness, uh, you know, on the set plays. Uh, that, you know, TFC is pretty damn good at set play. So I think they might get a couple. So I, I'm going to go share James's 2-2. Two, two. I, I think it's going to be a fun game that way. For me, I'm going with maybe what would be called a bold prediction. I'm calling it 3-1 Montreal victory. I've seen okay. Montreal hit the post way too often of the last two games for them not to score a few in the same one. Wouldn't be surprised if we see Piatti score one. Wouldn't be surprised if the Dream score ones and Canadian content, Samuel Piet. Why not? Why not? Against TFC at home. The future captain of this club. We all know. Yeah, that's how I predict. 3 1. I do feel Montreal is going gonna, is gonna to surprise a lot of people with their fitness. And I do feel that for the next few weeks, again, they're going to be able to take advantage of that. Uh, that advantage they have. Yeah, take advantage of an advantage. I know. But over the rest of the league, until the rest of the league's fitness levels rise a bit. But uh, I feel Montreal is going to win 3-1. And in that 3-1, two of those goals comes late after the 70th minute. It's going to be 1-1 until, until then. And then Montreal is going to score twice to make sure that the thousands of people that come to the Big O go home happy. There you go. Well, there's thousands that are going to be coming from Toronto, too, so they might not be going home as happy, although a uh, big party at Bertopia after I'm hearing through the grapevine, if you're a, well, maybe I shouldn't let that out there in case you're Montreal or don't crash. Be nice. It's St. Patrick's Day. All right. Um, yeah. 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 3 p.m. <laughs> the only time where 3 p.m. start, everybody's going to be drunk at 2 p.m. Like, hey, it's too late. All right. But at 11 a.m. Yeah. There you go. Um, the the most important question though is this the I'm trying to think is this the first game back at the Big O between TFC and Montreal since game one of the Eastern Final in '16 or did yeah. they play there last year? I don't recall. At the Big I think, O, I think it's the first one, but right. I'm not sure. So yeah, I, I think it is too because they didn't start the season against Montreal last year. They they played them quite late their first game, so I yeah. believe it was at uh, Saputo. I think actually TFC had the Saputo opener maybe last year. I, I'd have I, to go back like and that. look. Yeah, or, or at least for sure they played uh, the Canadian Championship. Uh, well, no. The, 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 anyways, yeah, it all blurs together. But, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, I think it is the yeah. first game at the Big O since uh, the 2016 Eastern Conference Final. So the, the important question is then, is the box going to be painted correctly? Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I, you, you know Houston as well, eh? You know, the Houston Dynamo can't paint lines too. Yeah. That's uh, forever going to be part of the lore. I, I wrote a, a column on uh, Canadian Soccer News, uh, which is relaunched again. I know it's our 17th relaunch, but bear with us here, folks. We're going to change the focus to more of a Canadian Premier League thing moving forward. But I did a, a, a TSE article where I ranked the 17 um, uh, best games of all time in TFC history. Don't ask me why I went 17, because I don't like to be held by the boxes of top 10s. So I went top 17, and uh, obviously uh, that... Uh, Game one and two of that Eastern Conference final was was very much in the top ten all time. I will never, the, we can, we'll never see a crazier series than that. I can't even no. imagine ever seeing something as it. So much happened in it. Both games, the 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 uh, the extra time aspect, the late two goals by Toronto have seen the first leg that changed the momentum of all that thing, and the first three goals and everybody's like, ah, it's over, it's done, it's three nothing Montreal, and two goals. Yeah, you will never see it happen again. Yeah. Let's talk about tomorrow's games, Dwayne, as well. Sure. Yeah, go, you go ahead. Lead, lead us through this, and we'll just talk a little bit about what to, what to expect next week or this weekend and what our thoughts are. DC United, Houston Dynamo, 1.30 p.m. on Saturday, the first game of the weekend. And, uh, well, it's still too early to, to really know what kind of DC United we're going to have this year. Same for the Houston Dynamo. Uh, good results and the not good results. It's too early to tell for those two, I think. Yeah, I mean, this is a, one of those measure games already in, in terms of you look at what they've done in the first two weeks and it's like, I, ain't, I don't know, it's like MLS <laughs> personified, right? Like that's, yeah. Um, 
I, I think the onus here is on Houston because I do think that by and large, although we make jokes about the good year, bad year thing with DC, I think by and large, most people look at DC right now and say they're probably a year away or so uh, from being particularly decent. And uh, Houston is a team that's coming off the Western Conference final last year. So, so Houston, I think, does have more of the onus here. And um, having lost to Vancouver last week uh, at home, uh, they will uh, want to get back out and uh, prove something there. But I'm not too sure what to expect from that one, as you say. I mean, that's great yeah. analysis, but what the hell are you supposed to do? It's <laughs> three of them last. No, we're honest. That's the thing. Minnesota, <laughs> Chicago. Minnesota, after a emotional win for Adrian Heath in Orlando, 3 nothing. It, it was a good time for Minnesota. Now they're they're playing Chicago at home. And, well, Chicago's good result, bad result, too. Where are they? At the same level as Minnesota. So I'm going to do the cop-out thing again and be like, yeah, I don't know what to expect for that game either. It's interesting. Chicago had three. They lost 4-3 to Kansas City uh, last week in their first game of the season. And, and it's hard to really handicap that because Kansas City this year, if you look at the defensive numbers, Kansas City has traditionally been such a strong defensive team that you just expect them to be good. So you look at Chicago where they scored three goals on them. That's amazing. But then you look at some of the shot numbers and some of the, the expected goals numbers that, that Kansas City are giving up this year, and you're like, what the hell's happening there? <laughs> so whether that's Chicago being good or, or, you know, being offensively gifted or whether that's Kansas City being, you know, porous, I'm not too sure. So, again, it's early. Minnesota, they look terrible in week one. Uh, they got the win in week two. So, again, very early. Uh, we need to really get about six weeks through an MLS yeah. season before you can start to really understand what's happening. But uh, So I hope, you're not, uh, I hope you're not putting too much money on MLS right now as parlays. One game, it's fine. But if you put your bet together, if you do some parlays, yeah, you might win a lot, but the chance of you actually winning uh, are, are getting very slim because there's like teams like Columbus, which it's still early, yes, for things to still derail. We still expect with all the controversy and the drama that's going to happen, if it's better right now that are moving or not or sold or whatever, it might be a lot of drama. But so far, they've looked like one of the best teams in the league. Which they should. I mean, if it wasn't for the, the I think, both of us in our preseason predictions were probably guilty, at least so far, of overvaluing what the distraction of sure. Save the Crew would do for the team. And it still might bite them in the bum, right? Like, you look forward for many, many months ahead and what they might do to break that team down, what they might do in terms of just the weighing of it. If the actual move gets announced at some point, that's going to have an impact. And that was overall, when I looked at the season, why I picked them lower. But in terms of the overall talent level and the success level of what they had last year, they're, they're building upon that, where they did give TFC everything and more in that Eastern Conference final. And then obviously beat them to open the season and then got the win, held on for the win against Montreal uh, with Raheem Edwards' clumsy penalty at the end there, obviously. Yes. So, yeah, this one is one that I... I you know, again, as you say, it's very difficult to be incredibly predictive about MLS early on, especially, which is actually why, ironically, it is a good league to bet on early on. You just bet on long shots. That's all, because <laughs> long shots aren't really long shots. Uh, but I do uh, think this one's which, one of the safer picks of the weekend. I, I would pick Columbus in this one. Yeah, I feel like Columbus, I would say the same. And uh, you just look at the odds, like, okay, if I put a dollar here, I'm giving 10. Okay, why not? Why not? Yeah. We've talked about Montreal, Toronto, NYC, FC, Orlando. <laughs> You remember that those two teams are expansion brethren? It's kind of weird, but uh, you remember when we thought Orlando was going to be the best teams of the two at the beginning? Well, I was about <laughs> to say, remember when there's two expansion brethren, that first year Orlando had a better season than NYCFC, but that's completely turned around since then. And, uh, Orlando's taken their coach on uh, with a stop in between. But, uh, yeah, it's – look – uh, yeah, I don't know what to say about uh, about Orlando right now, other than the fact that I told you so. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, you're right. NYCFC is going to have fun at home again next week. Of all this weekend, Atlanta, Vancouver. If I'm Vancouver, I kind of hope that there's not seventy two thousand people that comes and watch the game because, well, we didn't even talk about it all week, Dwayne. But Atlanta United yeah. last weekend. 72,391 person in the stadium. Yeah, and this is the new MLS, right? That when you have these teams launched, that there's an excitement around that. There's always the sort of the the, the model that they use where they're supporter-driven. Uh, that stadium is brand new there. There's a whole bunch of factors that are playing it. I'm not dismissing the fact they're getting 17,000 people out. Good for them, and they're having fun, and that's all that matters. But, 
but there's a lot of factors that are contributing to that in terms of the the long-term predictability of it but certainly a, a lot of excitement right now i'm very much looking forward to this game this this might be the game i most want to watch this weekend outside of toronto vancouver or toronto montreal pardon me because it really i think is going to be telling because vancouver has had a great start to the season with the two wins but we're not too sure about what houston is or what montreal is to be fair to both those clubs we do think Atlanta is a good team, despite their first week loss. Uh, they turned it around the second week. They're very good at home. And, and here we are looking at this one straight in the face. And I think this is going to be a very interesting and telling uh, game that, that I very much am looking forward to watching. And quickly, we have as well Kansas City, San Jose. Uh, yeah, Kansas City is going to have some fun versus the Quakes. And that one, mm -hmm. RSL, New York. RSL Red Bulls, and that one is interesting to me. RSL versus Red Bulls New York. It could be a, a fascinating matchup. Does Red Bulls continue on their great run? Can they do change up rotation and still have another result? And this time traveling to the riot and on the road with altitude, and that one is going to be interesting. Yeah, we've got an international break, and it, it's a couple weeks before. Well, it's more three weeks to the next round of the CONCACAF Champions League. So I doubt that we'll see much rotation from those teams this week because um, they were at home. So I, I suspect New York, uh, not only they were at home, but they, did, they only played the one game last week. So I, I think that you'll see a full lineup there. But RSL has got a lot of questions right now. And, and we talked about them a lot in on the Monday show. You want to go back and listen to that. You can get more detail there. But uh, certainly, I think this is a bigger game for RSL. This quickly on the SKC, I think I mentioned it earlier, the defensive side of things, that's what I'll be watching on that one and whether uh, SKC can tighten things up a little bit more. Uh, Kevin, I guess that leads us to our only uh, Sunday game of the week, and that yeah. is Dallas-Seattle. Uh, thoughts on that one? Uh, we'll, we'll see. Can Dallas right their, 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 their ship? Can, can Dallas regain that aura that it had Turns out to be almost 18 months ago now that they lost. Can they get that back? And playing at home against Seattle, if they're able to beat Seattle, then, you know, it's, it's a step in that direction. I'm not convinced by Dallas at all so far. And a win against Seattle would maybe start to make me believe in... It's still way too early to talk about a playoff, but like a successful beginning of season for Dallas... But they need to turn things around because it's not just the last few games. It's not just in the CCL where they lost to Toro. But it's last year and it's the, the last, the end of the season in 2016 as well wasn't convincing. So Dallas hasn't been Dallas for a while and we haven't talked about it that much. Yeah, uh, Dallas is always because of the nature of how they built the team. They're, they're not built around superstars nat naturally, although they do have some very good players that evolved into MLS stars. I, I'll leave the super off and just call them stars. So they, they have had that down thing. Uh, it's going to be interesting to watch that one, obviously, in terms of the Seattle and what they can do uh, off of their CCL adventures this week, where uh, you know they're going to look to continue beating up on the animals, the goats and bulls and all that sort of stuff. So we'll see how that works out for them. But uh Things about early on days, and not to belabor this, and we're not trying to pass the buck on it, but, you know, if, if I could predict these games with certainty, I wouldn't be podcasting. I'd be in Vegas. So here we are. I'm just looking forward to watching them, as always, and uh, looking forward to uh, moving into that international break. Big game for uh, Canada, I guess. Is it a big game? It kind of is because it's John <laughs> Herbin's debut next week. Yeah. So we'll be talking a lot about that next week, and uh, soccer goes on. Soccer just keeps ticking on, Kevin. It's always game time somewhere in the world, and that's what I love about this sport, too. You can follow Dwayne on Twitter at 24th Minutes, as always, and myself at Kev Laramie. Sober second thoughts this week, and uh, we'll see if Dwayne invites me to do uh, maybe uh, together. We'll see if uh, maybe we could do that, Dwayne. Uh, we'll see if I'm able to do it after the game, too. I'll be at the stadium. But uh, there's for sure going to be a sober second thought. There's going to be a uh, French of the Woodwork sur la transversale uh, reviewing the game. And as well, we'll be back on Monday to talk all about it right here on Soccer Today Live, Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. on YouTube.com slash Sports Podcasting Network. And you can take the pledge, help us continue our growth at Patreon.com slash Sports Podcasting Network. You're tired of being a freeloader? You're tired of, of thinking, ah, oh, those guys are bringing me to work. They're helping me know more about the world of soccer while I do other things. We need your help to continue to do other things too. And to do this, you can just go to patreon.com slash sports podcast network. Make sure you come in before the beginning of April where the two solitudes will meet again to talk about Canadian footy for patrons only. And until then, as always, have a great soccer. Go Montreal!
You can find the podcast version of all the shows we do on iTunes, Apple Podcast, Google Play Store, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, and anywhere you get your podcast. <laughs>